Jesus together. <laughs> if it's your first time to worship with us, we are so thankful that you're here. So honored that you'd come and spend your Sunday morning with us. Um, and I just want to tell you <laughs> that we love Jesus, that all of this is for him. It's all about him. We're not here to entertain or to perform. We're here to bless his heart, to minister to him, and to make a place where he wants to come and dwell and live in. As a family this morning, a family on mission, we're gonna do three things together. We practice these three things. I can't stress this enough. This is great practice time for us to do this because everywhere we go, when we leave this building, there will be opportunities to watch for God, ask for Jesus, and listen for Holy Spirit. So this is an amazing place to practice this. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are, this is a great place to practice this and get really good at it. So let's, let's say these three things together that we're gonna do today. Let's declare we're gonna watch for God, ask for Jesus, and listen for Holy Spirit. One more time. We're gonna watch for God, ask for Jesus, and listen for Holy Spirit. Psalm 100, it's a short one, <laughs> it's a good one. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. That has an exclamation point on it, just in case you're wondering. Serve the Lord with gladness, exclamation point. Come into his presence with singing, exclamation point. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. <sighs> Father, we have come today to sing of your goodness. We've come today, God, to just pour out an offering of thankfulness to you. about what happened in 2 Chronicles, and I know that I've said this recently, but when Solomon built the temple, rebuilt the temple for the ark, the thing that the people sang together in one voice was, you are good and your love endures forever. It wasn't when they finished the temple. It wasn't when they laid the last brick. It wasn't when they cut the ribbon. It was simply when they sang, you are good and your love endures forever, that his presence came like a cloud, that his glory came like a cloud. And my prayer today is that as we are singing, as we are lifting up this offering of praise to him, that he hears our voices today, sees our hearts, and says, I can't stay away from that. Lord, would you come as we lift up our voices, as we lift up our praise, as we give you our thanks, would you come and fill this place you're all we want. You're all we desire. Huh. You're the one we're seeking. You are the one that we want today. You're the only one that we want today.
Father, this morning it's our heart's desire to break open that bottle of perfume, God, and just to pour out our praise upon you. Lord, we posture ourselves, God, with a grateful heart as we enter into this Thanksgiving season, God, with a grateful heart. We're thankful for the blessings, God, that we see all around us, God. No matter what we walk through, God, we choose to see blessing, God. We choose to see, Lord, everything that you've put in our path, God, that is a blessing, God. Well, we're a grateful people, church. Well, come on, let's pour out our praise today in this place. Amen. Can we pour out our praise in this place? Come on, can we lift up our praise in this place, in this house? Oh, our praise. Oh, let it rise.
worthy of all of our praise. Lord, every song that we could sing, God, every dance that we could dance, and with all of our shouts of praise, God, it's not enough. It's not enough, God.
the situation or whatever it was that there's no way I'm going to make it. How am I going to keep my joy? How am I going to keep my hope? How am I going to keep my head up? But David, the psalmist said, I lift my eyes up to the hills where my hope comes from. As you were dancing in the back, I just felt the Lord smiling on you. Let's just lift up our eyes to him right now, just together. We lift up our eyes to you. You're where our help comes from. You're where our hope comes from. than we think you are. There's not a single situation or circumstance that we encounter that doesn't first sift through your hands. We remember right now that you are God most high. You are Lord over all. downcast, oh my soul, hope in God, hope in God, yeah. hope in God, get your hopes up, hope in God, hope in God, hope in God, come on, we need to hear this today, hope in God.
beloved, we have such a good Father that He would invite us to change the way we think about Him so that we can begin to see Him as He really is. I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to say because I'm actually going to prophesy. I want to prophesy under the unction of Holy Spirit this morning so that you can hear how good He really is. Because He wants a prepared people. And to be a prepared people is to be a people who understand and recognize and value who He really is. Not some facsimile of, not a secondhand story that you've heard about, or a book that may have encouraged you along the way. No, the living God as Father for you. And He's so good that He would speak to us about now, about how we prepare now. And so I want to prophesy over us this morning so that we can be a prepared people together. So listen to what I'm about to say. Change is coming to America. In the next three months, ah, don't clap yet, just hang in there, just hang in there. Change is coming to America in the next three months. Here's the deal, beloved. What you think about and what you desire is going to determine how you see the change. What you think about and what you desire is going to determine how you respond to the change that's coming. We're so familiar with the passage where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. There's liberty. And we only associate that with freedom from bondage, freedom from the devil, right? But you know, in the context of that passage, it's all about what we think about and what we desire. He said there's a veil over their minds and there's a veil over their hearts. If you want freedom, if you want liberty, change the way you think. It's the very definition of repentance. The Greek word metanoia. Meta means change. Noia means knowledge or thought. If you want to be free, change the way you think. If you want to be free, change what you desire. Holy desire. It will determine how you see the change coming. Is it going to be hardship or an opportunity for growth? Is it going to be negative or is it going to be the goodness of God coming to prepare a people. It will determine everything. So I want to pray over us this morning that we would respond to his goodness. There's two lies that the enemy never gets tired of sowing into the minds and hearts of believers. Number one is that God is good. He's always trying to convince the people of God that God is not good. Always. Never, he's relentless because if he can get you to believe that then he's got you God is good and he's doing good and he's doing good in you the moment you stop believing that you start a spiral you start down the ladder the second thing is that he'll try to get you to believe that God is not all powerful in his goodness He's either sovereign or he's not. He's either God above all gods or he's not. And he's constantly trying to break that understanding down so that we miss the fact that all things, we know all things work together for good, right? So please, just take a moment. Let's allow Holy Spirit to change the way we think, 
to change what we desire so that we can be a people ready. I have been under the throes of this uh, for days. And my wife and I had the privilege on Thursday to be in a room with a group of people honoring the life of a dear friend who had just passed. And here's what his wife told us. He died of ALS, hate diseases like ALS. It just robs the body of life. Here's what his wife told us. Never once did he complain. Never once did he let that disease rule his life. The last week of his life, they took him out to a field where the upper room is planning on building a new uh, location and he just wanted to pray on site because he knew he wouldn't see the building himself. So he wanted to go out to the property and pray and bless and see with a spiritual set of eyes what God was up to. The last thing he did on this earth he took communion with his wife, he closed his eyes, and he was ushered into the presence of the Lord. Whew, come on, beloved. That is changing the way you think and changing what you desire. If that's your cry, just lift your arms to heaven. testimony over all of us so that whatever comes, whatever change is right around the corner, Lord, we would be a people who can see you in the midst, who can invite you into every situation and hear the counsel of your heart and how we are to walk in these coming days. Lord, teach us how to change the way we think. Lord, we don't want sickness and disease in our midst. We pray for healing and virtuous life in all of us but Lord wherever it is present we want to rule above it we want to live above it we want the testimony of life in our lives in this house in our nation so Lord all that you're doing all that you want to release Lord we say yes and amen we are that people we're hungry we're desperate we need you God we need you God and we know you hear the cry of our heart this morning we do feel your pleasure, but we feel your pleasure in preparation that you are bringing something to us for us to understand that you truly are good and you truly are sovereign and you have all things at work in our lives for our good. This is what we know. This is what we're going to stand upon. In the name of Yeshua, name of Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do you receive that? Please, please pray into it. Allow the Lord to bring great liberty to your life in the way you think and in what you desire. sitting down and that's comfortable just stay right where you're at in that posture if you feel like standing that's okay too you just stay right there keep your heart right where it's at right there let's just begin to respond to him right now
Come on, you gotta shout it. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. You are good, you are good, and your love endures. Today, oh, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are. moments ago we had on the screen it looked like a ripple effect because this is what I want you to think about through the remainder of this day that's what God is calling us to be right there right in the very center as we walk with him as we allow him to change the way we think the way we even view our assignment. Do you realize you're on assignment here on this planet? And as a child of God, God wants to use you. And he says, if you'll stay right in the center and allow me to move, your life will go forth just as the word of God goes forth. But it will have a ripple effect wherever it goes. I don't know about you, but that's how I want my life to be. I don't want to go through life and one day somebody goes, well, there was this guy named Lynn Bullock and I, I don't even know. No, I, I, not for my glory, but for people to go, there was this guy who walked with God and his life, God just oozed out of him. Wherever he went, that's what the Lord wants to do in and through every single one of us. But you have to say, even as Norm had in his prayer, Yes and amen. Yes, Lord. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And so, Father, take these next moments as we just reflect on what we've already heard through worship, through the word spoken over us, to the word that's going to be shared with us in a few moments. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, hey, as we enter into this holiday season, you know, we're always going to say Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas. We're not going to say Happy Holidays. But there's an opportunity that we as the faith family have at the church at Benbrook, and that is to minister to families within our community. Out in the foyer is a tree out there, and it's the Spirit of Christmas tree. On it are 47 different names of children that we have the privilege and the opportunity to help minister to that family and to those kids and to say, let us be a blessing to you. And so at the conclusion of our service, Sarah's gonna be out there because there's a process to this. You just don't yank it and go. We have to know who took it, all right? So that we're not having to chase and run down folks. But I wanna challenge you. In the years past, people have kind of hung in here and by the time they got out there, all the names were gone. And so we want you to be blessed through the opportunity of giving back and ministering to a family in need. So be sure and see Sarah at the conclusion out in the foyer there so that you can be a part of helping make somebody have a great Christmas, all right? Who otherwise, Christmas will just be another day for them. Also, um, and she'll tell you this, but everything has to be back in by Sunday the 12th. So we're giving you two or three weeks to gather stuff. And there's a process that'll explain how you do them. You don't have to wrap all the presents. You just bring them back. There's a, uh, a group of folks that will wrap everything and deliver them also. You saw this t-shirt here. All right. We, this is going to be our, spring, our winter and spring shirt. Okay. It carries our vision to live, love, and serve like Jesus. And so starting on the 5th of December, you can sign up. If you'd like to purchase one of these, there'll be, uh, you can, we're gonna order them for three weeks, put everything together, and then we'll place the order and we'll have them back right after the first of the year. But if you'd like to get one of these, you can do so. Um, we're gonna have child dedication right now. And so, yeah, Miss Sarah, will you come up and Philip and Lana? I know you've got some family with you. Why don't y'all come on up here? Come on. Yeah. I'll pass the baton. You need this? Okay. Good morning. So this is Eleanor Victoria. <laughs> and she is Grandma and Grandpa are coming. Um, she turned 11 months yesterday, right? Yesterday. Okay, so Eleanor, it's always so cool um, when we do child dedications, how the meaning of the children's name and what the word that the Lord gives, and then you look at the child and go, oh my gosh, that's so fitting. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Um, and if you have not been with us for a child dedication before, this is not baby baptism. This is the parents standing before you saying, we are committing to um, raise our child in the church, train them up in the way they should go. And then we as the body are partnering with them and saying, we are standing alongside you for encouragement and support and um, just anything that your family needs as you raise up this beautiful baby girl. So Eleanor, your name means kind-hearted and gracious. And the verse for... <laughs> the verse for kind-hearted is Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. And the verse for gracious is Psalm 145, 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And your middle name, Victoria, yes. <laughs> um, Victoria means triumphant spirit. 
And the verses for that are Philippians 4.13, I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. And the second verse is 1 John 4.4, 4, Dear children, you belong to God. You have not accepted the teachings of the false prophets. That's because the one who is in you is powerful. He is more powerful than the one who is in the world. And the word that I asked the Lord, I asked the Lord for a word for Eleanor, and he said that these, the kind-hearted and gracious and triumphant spirit, it's not going to be a like hard, not assertive, but it's going to be so gracious and coated in honey that her leadership and conquering is going to be humbling for others to watch um, and very hospitable, which when you look at her personality, she's T-Cab's girl. <laughs> so we would like to pray over the McClure's. So friends, family, TCAB, let's surround them and just um, pray over this wonderful family. So God, we thank you for the blessing of children. We thank you for allowing us to witness your miracles daily. And today we honor the miracle of Eleanor Victoria McClure and all that she is and will be for her faith, her family, her community, and the kingdom. Holy Spirit, please outpour your wisdom and encouragement for Philip and Lana as they raise up this warrior sister and all that she is going to do to bring glory to your name. We thank you for the light and joy that she is. She loves every person and does not know a stranger. She loves all of your children equally, and we thank you for that gift. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. It's the next generation right there that will take the church further than we can even imagine all that God is going to do. If you've been around Philip and Lana, you get around Eleanor, she's just the perfect baby. I mean, she just is. I know Philip's probably saying, yeah, tell me that at 2.30 in the morning, but... Uh, She's always got a smile. There's, there's joy in her life. And that only comes from the Lord. Amen. All right. And so remember to pray for Philip and Lana and little Eleanor. Well, this morning we've got a treat. Um, Got a young man that's going to be bringing the word. Last week we had Ben. Didn't Ben do a great job last week? I noticed several people walked out of here twitching. I'm not sure what that was about. But <laughs> um, but Debbie and I had the privilege to, um, yeah, you're, yeah, thank you for holding that up. Hey, it's offering time, guys. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> My wife's standing there holding an offering envelope going like, you better not forget this. We're going to go ahead and pass the buckets. They're on the left side over there. Um, and so as we pass those. Um, but Debbie and I had the opportunity to meet Stephen Terry Cook probably about five or six years ago. Uh, we started a prayer gathering on one Sunday night a month at different churches. And different churches would come, and that pastor would lead and, and Steve and Terry pastored Impact Church just right down 377 on the other side 
of I-20. And so we begin to develop more than just a ministerial friendship, uh, but a friend, friendship, friendship. They walk with God. They are anointed. The Holy Spirit is all over them. And God has used them in amazing ways to bless the body of Christ. And it's not like he hasn't got any experience. He's got as many years in ministry as I do. Uh, but every time I sit under his preaching or teaching, God stretches me. He's going to do the same thing for you this morning. So let me pray for us. And Steve's going to come and bring the word for us. Father, thank you again. Just thank you for the privilege of being in a house of faith where we can worship you, where we can just celebrate. You're so good. I, I mean, God, just everything about even this morning has been about reminding us of how good you are and the blessings that you bring to each one of us. And now, Father, prepare our hearts for the word of God that will be shared with us as Steve comes to share. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's welcome Steve Cook as he comes up. All right, thank you, Pastor Lynn and Debbie. And just praise God. If you can't follow that, you got problems. <laughs> God is so good, isn't he? He is so good. I just want to give a shout out to my friend Chad here. Chad, he told, I came in, I said, is that Chad? You know what, he's, he told me he's lost 80 pounds. You know what, that is awesome, brother. That is awesome. I just want you to know that God loves you, brother. And I want, you, I want you to know that he is well pleased with you. A man can fall seven times, a righteous man, but he gets up. That's what is important, that you get back up. And I think you have made a turn in your life, Chad. This, there has been a turn that has come, and everything in the past is the past now. And you have the future to look forward to. But more than that, I want you to know, God is well pleased with you, brother. He's well pleased with you. It's not because of anything you did or that you lost 80 pounds. That's awesome. But he's pleased with you because you're his son. When Jesus was baptized, he came out of the water and a voice from heaven came down and said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. You know what? Jesus hadn't even started his ministry at that time. He hadn't done all the great miracles that he was going to do. He was well pleased with Jesus simply because he was his Son. That's where we start. We spend our whole life trying to get God to like us, but he likes us. He loves us. He thinks you're awesome already, and he's well pleased with you already. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. I want to read you a little story, short story, before I begin. It says this. After a long and boring sermon, <laughs> anybody ever been through one of those? <laughs> Hopefully it's not today. <laughs> After a long and boring sermon, the members filed out of the church saying nothing to the preacher. Towards the end of the line, a thoughtful young person who always commented on the sermons told the pastor, Pastor, today your sermon reminded me of the peace and the love of God. The pastor was thrilled. No one has ever said anything like that about my preaching before. Tell me why you say that. And the young man said, well, it reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all understanding. And it reminded me of the love of God because it endured forever. <laughs> so, so, again, hopefully that's not anybody says that today. But uh, praise God. I want to, anybody know what a life verse is? 
a life verse. It's a verse that, of the Bible, <laughs> hopefully. It's a, a verse out of the Bible that you just grab a hold of. I mean, you read it and you think, that is for me. That is my verse. I have a whole handful of them, but I want to share one with you this morning and speak a little bit about it. It is Proverbs twenty two twenty eight. So if we could just stand for the reading of the word. Proverbs twenty two twenty eight. I'm reading this out of the New King James Version. Proverbs twenty two twenty eight. My life verse. One of them. It says this. Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Is that awesome or what? Let me read that again. Do not remove the ancient landmark. Some, ver some uh, versions say boundary, because that's what it's talking about. It's not talking about this is where this person was born. It's talking about marking the land, the boundary of the land. Do not remove the ancient boundary which your fathers have set. Amen? Amen? Let's just raise our hands. Lord, we just say do whatever you want to do. And Lord, I just ask that you would speak to our hearts that you would change our minds and you would change our lives through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. I can see y'all are thrilled about that verse. <laughs> Let me give you some context of it, the verse. When the, when the children of Israel came out of captivity in Egypt, and they entered into the promised land, the Lord, for each tribe, each of the 12 tribes except for the priestly tribe, they were to receive an inheritance. And that inheritance was land in the promised land. And the Lord dictated this tribe is going to receive this piece, this tribe will receive this piece, this tribe will receive this piece, and he marked it out. You can read it in the Bible. It says, your, your property will run from this river, it will run over to the great sea, and then it will run over here, and you can read all that. And, and when they entered into the promised land, each tribe took their piece of property and they subdivided it among the clans. And it was all, be, and they did it by lot. So it was the Lord giving the person that got that piece of property, it was what the Lord wanted them to have. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So they subdivided the pro property up, and, you know, and, they, and they would say, okay, it runs from this river over to here to this big oak tree, and from that oak tree to the edge of that mountain. But sometimes there wasn't a landmark like that. So what did they do? They didn't have fences back then. So they would just take a big stone or something, a big stone or maybe a pile of stones, and, and say, okay, this is the marker. This is the boundary. This is the landmark for this clan's land. It starts here, and the next clan's land starts here, and we're going to put it here. And, but the Lord was wise enough to, in the law to put twice, twice in the law, he, he said, do not move a boundary. And it's also uh, repeated here in Proverbs. Why? Because humans being humans, right? This, this clan could say, hey, his land's looking pretty good over there. And he's, you know, he's really not using it like he should. So I'm going to send some people out in the middle of the night, and I'm going to have them move that. Could you bring my boundaries up here? <laughs> Thank you. I forgot my markers. Can't do it without that. So there's an ancient boundary. We're going to put it there. We're going to put one over here. There's another boundary. Now, this is my property here. And so what happens is, in the middle of the night, my neighbor gets up, and he takes a bunch of guys, and he takes that land marker, and he rolls it over here. And suddenly... He's got more property, right? 
So that's what this scripture is saying. It says, do not move an ancient boundary. In fact, one of the, in, in the law it says, cursed is the man who moves a boundary. So not only is it against the law, but it, there is a curse that comes with moving a boundary. So, do not move an ancient boundary. You follow me so far? You with me? Okay, I just want to look at it a little different this morning. Because you can move a boundary. It goes two ways, right? It goes both ways. My neighbor could get up in the middle of the night, or I could get up in the middle of the night, and I could move my bound, the boundary marker over on my neighbor's property so that I take his land. That's what the, that's what the law is saying. He said, don't move the boundary. He's saying, don't steal from your neighbor. But I could also get up in the middle of the night, and I could take my boundary, and I could move it this way, right? And I could give up property. I could give up a piece of my inheritance. Now, who would do that? But who would do that? <laughs> who would do that? Well, my proposition this morning is that Christians do it all the time. I've lived most of my life giving up what is rightfully mine, an inheritance that I have. When I said yes to Jesus Christ, I was given a promised land inheritance, and I have spent most of my life giving that up. But I'm here to tell you, Norm, that, you know what, I have found the enemy out, and now I'm going to move that ancient boundary back to where it belongs. Do not move an ancient boundary. In Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, when God created man, he, man received three things. Relationship. He received identity out of that relationship. And he was given dominion over the earth. Relationship, identity, dominion. If you read the third chapter of Genesis, Satan came, deceived the man and the woman. And, and what happened? Man lost relationship. Because he lost that relationship, he lost his identity. And because he lost his identity, he was unable to, to have dominion over the earth the way that God intended it to be. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? The rest of up, leading up to Jesus is God reestablishing what was lost. Jesus Christ came, and in Luke 19.10 it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? Relationship, identity, dominion. And when G it says, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, and when Jesus Christ hung on the cross and said, and died and said, it is finished. He wasn't saying, I am finished. He's saying, it is finished. What was finished? What was finished was the, that Satan had your ability to have relationship, identity, and dominion. That was one back at the cross. And how do we know that? Because the Bible tells us that when Jesus cried out and gave up his last breath, the veil in the temple that separated God and man. And I'm not talking some wimpy little sheet. It was a thick curtain. And God, it says it was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. You know who ripped that in two? God ripped that in two. He, he said, I've been waiting for this moment. And now it is finished. The price has been paid. Boom! I can have relationship with my children again. And they can begin to realize who they are in me. And they can begin to have dominion in their life and not spend the rest of their life being run over by a truck. Does that make sense what I'm saying? That is what we're winning back. That is the territory that God has given us. And when we say yes to Jesus, we're saying yes to relationship with him. We're saying yes to a finding out our identity that flows from him, that we are created in the image of God. 
That is our identity. And out of that identity, we can then move into what God's plan was in the very beginning when he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Awesome. Do not move that ancient boundary. Because when we say yes to Jesus, the same Satan that was in the garden is going to try the same thing on you to steal that away again. Does anybody know what does anybody know what the term gaslighting means? Anybody ever hear that term? You don't hear it very much. You hear it a lot. You've heard it a lot more the last few years uh, in the political arena. But gaslighting, you know what that is? Gaslighting is when someone... Gaslighting is when someone questions their own, own reality. Here's a longer definition of it. The term may also be used to describe a person who effectively, listen to, the, listen to this, a term that describes a person who effectively puts forth a false narrative that leads another person or a group of people to doubt their own perceptions, their own reality, and become disoriented or distressed. Did you get what I said? Let me read it again. The term is used to describe a person who is called the gas lighter, <laughs> who effectively puts forth a false narrative that leads another person or a group of people to doubt their own perceptions and reality and become disoriented and distressed. If you want to see examples of that, just turn on the TV. You'll see lots of it. I'll give you an example. I wasn't going to say this, but I got it too. <laughs> when someone tells you there's 53 different genders and that you can switch to that gender daily, you know that's not true. You know that's not true. But then they, if you say that, they call you a racist, bigoted, homophobe, right-winger who believes in flat earth. That's what they call you. But what are they doing? They're trying to gaslight you. They're trying to make you believe a false reality. The term was derived from a 1944 film called Gaslight. And in the movie, his husband was through trickery, was trying to, well, not trying, but he convinced his wife that she was insane and was committed to an insane asylum so he, that he could steal her inheritance. Who's that sound like? <laughs> Who does that sound like? That is our enemy. That's what Satan does. He tries to gaslight us. He, tries, he lies to us so that we believe a lie, and we take what, we, what God has said to be true, and we relent it to him, and he steals our inheritance. And what we say, Norm, is no more. Yeah. Do not move the ancient boundary that God has set in his word for us. Don't let the devil gaslight you. Here's a perfect example in my life. I'm going to use a lot of examples in my life. This morning we sang Psalm 36. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Right? That is the truth. That is the boundary in all of our lives is that God is good and he's good all the time. That is the boundary. But I lived most of my life not believing that. I'm talking about as a minister. I saw the good, I could see the goodness of God in everybody. I've always had the gift to be able to see the gold in people. But when I looked in the mirror, not so much. 
I knew God was good to Lynn. He's good to Debbie. He's good to Norm. He's good to Terry. He's good to Chad. He's good to everybody. But when I looked in the mirror, I thought, he's not good to me. And I just thought that's just the way that it was. I just thought, some will win, some will lose, some are born to sing the blues, and I was one of those that was born to sing the blues. And I accepted that. I took the boundary of God's goodness in my life. I believed it for everybody else, but I moved it way over here, and I said, God is just not good to me. And I accepted that. Is anybody in that boat? Anybody in that boat? You know what? It's a lie. Don't let Satan gaslight you. Don't let him believe some, don't let him have you believe some false reality. Because the reality is God is good, and he's good all the time, and he's good to everyone. And he's not just good because if I do good or I speak well, he may be a little bit happy with me. But if I don't, he's not happy with me. It's like the flower. Uh, he loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves. No, throw that daisy away. He loves you. He loves you. Who, ha who again has that in them? Who has it? Some people raise their hand. Who was it? Jamie, I want you to come up here. I want you to take, prophetically, I want you to take that boundary. And I want you to move it over where it's supposed to be. As a, as a prophetic act, I want you to move, take the boundary and tell Satan, I no longer believe your lie. I am not going to move an ancient boundary and move it back to where it was. Yes. I am no longer going to believe your lie. Yes. You cannot move my boundary. Yes. I'm going to move it back. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> yes. Woo! See how far she moved that over there? That's awesome. <laughs> Another example is the children of Israel. When they came out of, the, out of bondage, it was God's intent for every Israeli to be a priest to God. He called them and he said, Send all, I want all the people to come out and meet me tomorrow on the mountain. And when they came out, on the mountain, the cloud, there was a cloud over it. There was fire. There was thunder. There was lightning. There was earthquake. There was a big trumpet blowing, and it freaked them out. And they told Moses, they said, Moses, we can't handle this. We're afraid of this. I, you go, and you talk to God, and then you come back and tell us, and we'll do whatever he says. And that's exactly what happened. And if you read, it, 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 later you see where Moses would go to the tent to meet with God, and it said the people stood in their doorways and just watched while God met with... That's not what God intended. That's not what he intended. He intended for all, every one of them to have a relationship with him. And we're talking about uh, foundational things. We're talking about uh, the basics the cornerstone basic is relationship. The cornerstone of all the others is relationship. We've talked about uh, other type of, uh, of basics of the word, of prayer, of community, of servanthood. But all those things, the very cornerstone of every one of those things is relationship. Because if you do not have that relationship, the other things that we do are going to be skewed. You're going to be, they're going to be skewed. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? 
If we don't have that intimate relationship, if we don't get that down, and if we don't also get down that, that the identity that we are made in His image, and if we don't understand who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us, when we, yes, we need to pray, but we're going to pray amiss. Why? Because you don't know the heart of God. I'm not saying don't pray. <laughs> what I am saying is those other things have to flow out of relationship. I spent most of my life praying, thinking that was going to build a relationship with the Lord. And he said, no, build the relationship. <laughs> and out of that relationship is going to flow prayers. And those will be effective, fervent prayers that avail much. I, I, used to, I used to, again, this was as a minister. I know this sounds ridiculous. But this, as a minister, I love the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. I love that. And I, would, I, I love to quote it. I love to teach it. I love to preach it. And one time I was in the middle of teaching it. And God said, this is, listen to how you say the prayer when you say it. This is how I'd say it. Our Father who in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. What was I doing? I was going straight to your kingdom come, your will be done. And he, told, he said, I want you to go back and I want you to read the first clause. <laughs> go back and read the very first clause of that prayer. What is it? Our Father. He said, you're trying to bring God's kingdom and it's not effective because you don't know my heart. <laughs> you don't know me as Father. And when you pray prayers about the kingdom, you don't know what to ask for because you don't know my heart. Find my heart and then pray the prayer. You know what I had done? I had just moved the boundary. I did not know. I know, again, this sounds ridiculous. I did not know God as Father. As a minister, Chad, I knew his word, and we had some great results, didn't we, Terry? But I didn't know him as father. I knew him as boss. <laughs> I knew him as God. I knew him as the sovereign, and I was his servant. And again, there, yes, we are his servants. But if that servanthood doesn't flow out of sonship, then what it is is works. And when I would pray and when I would declare his kingdom, I didn't know really, Chad, how to declare the right thing because I didn't know the heart of God. But thank God that all changed. <laughs> thank God I took the boundaries and moved them back that boundary of fatherhood which I had taken and moved. And it wasn't even a boundary because it wasn't even in my life. I took the boundary again. I said, I'm moving it back to its rightful place. And I began to realize and walk in what it meant to be a son of God. And that makes all the difference in the world. Again, it's just not, you, you, when, you, when you don't see God as your father and you don't see that he loves you and you don't see that he's pleased with you and you don't see that he's good, you're always going back and forth. He loves me, he hates me, he loves me, he hates me. And, I'd, I, and I would look in the mirror and think, God does not like me. And I know he's up there and he's just being patient. He really wants to smash me. It's just a matter of time. 
You know what? That is a horrible way to live. That is a horrible way to live your Christian life. But if Satan can gaslight you into believing that, he will rob that from you. And if he robs relationship from you, and if he robs identity from you, he can rob everything else. Is anybody in that spot? Does anybody, is anybody, does that resonate? Everybody's afraid to raise their hand now because they know what's coming. <laughs> anybody? I tell you what, if you're in that spot, do not move that boundary. It has been moved. Move it back and set it and never touch it again or doubt it again. Do not move the ancient boundary. I'm on page one of my six-page notes there, Lynn. <laughs> I want to look at Luke 15, and I'll do it quickly. I'll do it very quickly, but Luke 15 changed my life. I will always live and preach out of Luke 15 because it absolutely revolutionized my life. And if you know the 15th chapter of Luke, it's three parables. And the third parable is what some people call the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. You know, I like to call it the parable of the loving father because <laughs> that's really what it is. You know, if, you, if somebody asks you, what's the Bible all about, in just one sentence, <laughs> what is the Bible about? Yeah, I mean, you could say a lot of things and probably be correct on all, a lot of them. Uh, but what's the Bible all about? It's the story of a dad who wants his kids back. A story of a dad who wants his kids back. Luke 15 the prodigal son, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we, we probably know the story. If you don't, the son, or son asked for his inheritance, which in that culture was a big no-no. And he took it and went to a foreign country, big no-no. He uh, lost it all, super big no-no, right? So, I mean, in, in this culture, what he did was very, very, very bad. And, uh, of course, he lost all his money. He ended up having to slop pigs. And he was starving to death. And, he, and when the pigs eat better than you, you know it's, you got trouble. So he said, and he said, listen, this is crazy. I'm going to go back to my father's house. And, he, made, and he, he knew what was coming. In that culture, they actually had a ceremony that if, if someone brought great shame upon their family or on the village... If they came back to that village, they had a ceremony where they would fill a big pot full of wheat, and they would t the whole village would go out to the, to the person, and they would break it, and the wheat would spill all over the place, and they would say, you are cut off from this village. They excommunicated the person from the village and the family, and no one was allowed to help that person or relate to that person. So, think about that. So when the son says, I'm going to go back to my father, and he's making this long speech up, you know, I'm no longer worthy to be your son, and, and I just make me a slave so I have enough food so I don't starve to death. And he, when he was going back to the village, it says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Why did he do that? He wanted to get to him before the villagers did. He wanted to get to him before he had to go through the shame of that ceremony. He wanted to get to him before they were able to excommunicate him from the village. Does that make sense? The father ran to him, and the son said to him, Now here he goes, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, He didn't even let him finish. He didn't even let him finish. 
The father said to the servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost but is found. And they began to make merry. So he didn't even let him finish. He just said, Father, I'm not worthy to be his son. He said, Go get a robe. Get a ring. Get some shoes. Get that fattest calf you could find because we're going to celebrate because my son has returned. And listen, in the NIV, I love this. In the NIV, it says, he told them, quickly, go quickly and get a robe. He didn't have to have a two-year probation to see if he was going to be good enough to be a son again. As soon as he came back to the father, the father said, my boy's home. Go give him back everything that belongs to him. Give him a robe. Give him a ring. Give him authority. Give him shoes. He's part of the family. Get the fatted calf. Give him provision. Everything he needs, give it to him. He didn't have to wait. We, sometimes we think we have to wait. You know, I'm so bad. I've been so bad. That I'm not worthy to be your son. That's a lie. None of us, if that was the case, none of us would be sons or daughters. The boundary that God set when he ripped that veil in two and split it, what he reestablished was relationship, identity, and dominion, and there was not a probation period for it, Chad. It was then and there, and, and it was accessible to those who accepted Jesus Christ. That was the boundary that was set. Don't move the boundary and say, well, you know, Ben, you know, he really screwed up. So uh, his inheritance is this, but you know what? It's going to have to be this for five years. And if he proves himself, then maybe uh, we move it over here a little bit. And another five years, maybe over here. But if he screws up, we're going to move it over here again. Do not move an ancient boundary because God doesn't move them. God does not move those boundaries. Who are we to move those boundaries? Who are we to say, I'm not worthy? Who are we to say that someone else is not worthy? Do not move the ancient boundary that God has set. But that's what this son was doing. You know how many Christians do that? I'll never forget, Terry had a, somebody that worked for her. And uh, she went to church every Sunday, took Eucharist every Sunday, and did all the right things, right? Nothing wrong with any of that. But one day, Terry was talking about praying and how she prayed. You know, she was saying something about praying to God about something. And the girl said, oh, I could never do that. I would never do that. She meant she would never pray to God like that. Why? Why? Because she didn't feel worthy. Satan had gaslighted her to taking what was rightfully hers moved it over here and said, praying to God is only for the priest. Praying for God is only for the super saints. Praying for God is only if you're good enough. Praying for God it can only be accomplished if you don't sin for so many days and you say so many things and do so many things. Do not move that boundary. But I know that Christians do that. because You know how I know that? Because I've done it. <laughs> I've done it. I'm not worthy to be your son. Well, who told you that? Think about in the garden when, when Satan deceived the woman and God walked into the garden and, and Adam was hiding himself because he was naked. And, and God said, Adam, where are you? He said, well, I'm hiding because I'm naked. <laughs> and he said, who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you weren't worthy? Who told you that, that shame is going to reside on your life? Who told you? Who told you that? Who told you that condemnation is going to rest upon you? Who told you that you're not good enough? Who told you that? I can tell you who told you that. The gaslighter himself. Satan's telling you that. 
But what God is saying is do not move the ancient boundary that I established. Jesus did not die and, cover, and recover what was lost so that we could move the boundary because we don't feel worthy. Or others tell us that we're not worthy. You are worthy. <laughs> you are part of the beloved. One more son, Lynn. <laughs> okay? <laughs> because there's another son in the story. His older brother. You know what? I've been both. I've been the younger son, and I've been the elder brother. But the younger son came back, repented. The father said, you're not, not going to be my slave. You're my son. And restored him and celebrated. And the elder son, it says, now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked them, what these things meant and he said to him your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound your father has killed the fatted calf and but this brother was angry and would not go in therefore his father came out and pleaded with him so he answered and said to his father lo these many years I have been serving you and never transgressed your commandment at any time and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends but as soon as this son of yours comes, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you kill the fatted calf for him. And, and the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. You know, I've lived that life right there. I've lived, I can't say Terry and I, because I can't speak for Terry as much as me, but I've lived this life. I've lived the elder son life. I've lived where ministry, we're in ministry. We've laid down our life to minister. We've given up things. We've done this. Now listen, listen to what I'm saying. We did this, we did that. That's exactly what he was saying. I'm, I've served you all this time. I'm serving God and I've sacrificed and, and we've given up all kinds of things. And, and uh, then, listen, we have ministered to people. We've ministered to females who, who took drugs up to the very point of birth. And their babies were perfect. You know, I thank God for that. But in my mind, I'm thinking, we have sacrificed. We have done this. And we have a child. And we find out that something is not right with it. And, you, and the, I had that mentality of the elder son. I did all this and I've been serving you. And you haven't given me nothing. I don't, that's not good English. But you haven't given me anything. That's really the way I felt. Listen, I love my daughter. But do you understand what I'm saying? You've given me nothing. I served you. I haven't, I've, I can't say I've never done anything wrong, but I've served you all these years. And what is this? What is this? And God said, son, all I have is yours you just need to take it. If you wanted a goat to party with your friends, go get a goat and party with your friends. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I had a servant mentality. I'm serving God, and I'm looking at him as my boss. I'm looking at him as my, you know, he is my boss, and I do serve him. But I was not looking at God in the eyes of a son. I was looking at him, if I'm serving him, I'm doing this for God, I'm doing that for God, and it's just not good enough because look what happens in my life. 
Look at these things that ha- come along in our life and in our marriage and in our family. And God just hasn't given me nothing. He said, son, it's because you don't realize you already have everything. Everything I have is already yours. And I had to realize, you know what, I have a slave mentality. And it has skewed my entire life. I'm not a slave. I am a son who serves in the house. There's a big difference. Do not, what what did I do? The, The boundary was sonship. I took it and moved it. And you know what? That brought a curse in my life. Because I moved that boundary. But you know what? We've moved it back. And now I'm going to spend the rest of my life telling other people, do not move an ancient boundary. Don't let the devil gaslight you. Don't let the devil steal from you. Don't let him take one iota of what God has given you. I didn't even get to page three, but that's all right. Here's another example. I want to use one more example. You know, we all have something that God's given us. The Bible says we all have a gift. We all have gifts. And the church needs every one of us to be operating in those gifts for the benefit of all. Don't let Satan lie to you and say, the only people that have gifts are those that are up here. That's a lie. That is a lie. You have a gift. Don't let the devil gaslight you into saying, well, my, my duty is just to sit here in the pew and pay my tithes. Well, do that. Right? But also, find out what, God, find out what the boundaries of your life are. Find out what gift you have. There are people in here that have the gift of healing. There are people in here that have the gift of prophecy. There are people in here that have the the gift of miracles. There are people in here that have gifts, and if you don't operate them, something's missing in the church. But more than that, Satan is stealing your inheritance from you. And do not let him do that. Listen, we, used to, we would pray for people. We would pray for people. You know what? One time we had an elder that got sick, and we prayed, laid hands on him, prayed God, you know, anointed him, oiled him up, prayed, faith, power. He died. <laughs> what did I do with that? What did I do with that? What do I do when I... I'm praying for someone, and Satan likes to do this. He he doesn't get away with it anymore. But we would be praying for people, and out of the corner of my eye, I would see my daughter. And Satan would say, what are you doing? You don't even have enough faith for your daughter to be healed. (laughs) Why are you praying for this person? Besides, Richard died. (laughs) <laughs> no, he would try to gaslight me and it would have been very easy for me to take that boundary and move it over here it would be very easy for me to have said make up, and make up a theology that fits my situation God doesn't heal anymore that's a lie or you know uh, some, some, you hear the most ridiculous, stupid things that people make up to justify why they're moving that boundary. You know, uh, I don't have enough faith, or you don't have enough faith, or, or uh, you must have sin in your life somewhere. Or I've heard someone say this person died because they owned a cat. Don't make up stupid theology. You keep the boundary there. And have your situation fit the, th- the fit the boundary and not the boundary fit your theology. Does that make sense what I just said? Don't move 
an ancient boundary to fit what you think. No, that's what Adam and Eve did. That was what was their sin? What was their sin? They ate the fruit, the wrong fruit. But what was the fruit? The fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Chad, it's not up to us to decide what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, what's possible or what's not impossible. That comes from God, and we line up with that. And if we don't understand it, you know what? There is a bound. Part of our inheritance is there, there's this big space over here of I don't know, of mystery, of why is my daughter not healed? We prayed for multiple people and they've been healed, but how come my daughter is not healed? I could make up some stupid theology and move the boundary, or I could just say, you know what? I'm just going to put it over there in that plot of land, and that's the, that is the I don't know. But I do know this, that God is good and that God heals and that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's where I'm going to leave it and that's where it's going to stay until she's healed and then I can have her testify of God's goodness. You know, Satan all the time tries to gaslight me into, you've prayed this prayer a thousand times for her. You've said that. Multiple times. You know what? We're not going to start praying. But Terry had a revelation. Well, we, we listened to a sermon, and he was speaking. I think it was Psalm 62. And at the beginning of the psalm, he's saying, I'm praying. And in the middle of the psalm, he's saying, I'm declaring. There's a time to pray, and there's a time to declare. And what Satan wants to gaslight me into is saying, you've declared all kinds of things over your daughter. It's not obviously not going to work, so just stop. Well, I'm not stopping. Why? Because the boundary's here, and I'm not going to move it any further. So, Lord, I declare over my daughter that she will speak, that she will stand and testify of your goodness, that she will touch that. It won't be, and I'm not talking about when we get to heaven. I'm talking about here on earth. So when I pray, your kingdom come, I'm praying, God, I pray that the voice she's going to have in your kingdom, I pull it down here to earth. I want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Do not move an ancient boundary. Don't move it. I have so much more I could share. But I just want, I want you to know, Satan will try to gaslight you. And he will gaslight you to oblivion if you let him. But it doesn't have to be that way. What we have to do is find out what our inheritance is. Find out who we are. Find out that we have an intimate relationship with the Father God. And out of that intimate relationship flows our identity. That we are made in His image. And out of that flows everything else that we do. And when we start moving in that, the boundaries just stay out there. Don't make up some things if things don't make sense. Don't make things up to try to make them make the sense. I had a pastor that one of the wisest things he ever said to me, and he would say it over and over. He said, when you don't know something, always go back to what you do know. I don't know why this happened. I don't have to know. This is what I know. God is good. Amen? Amen? Do not move that. You know, I think that's the main boundary for this morning is the goodness of God. Don't move it. Don't move it. Amen? So, Lynn, I don't know how you want to end this. but <laughs> Pray for us, brother. Yes.
who has moved boundaries in their life? Where's my, where's my counselor once said? Well, then stop it. <laughs> what are you doing? This, well, stop it. <laughs> I just want to pray for us. And especially if you have moved that boundary of the goodness of God. Or you have moved that boundary of I'm not worthy. Or you have moved that boundary of, of I'm just a slave, I'm just a servant, and I'm just serving God, and it just seems like drudgery, and everything I do is not good enough. And I just want to pray for you that God would deliver you out of that mindset, that He would change the way you think about who you are, that you're not just serving God. You are His son. You are His daughter. You, and He loves you, and He cares for you, and He's pleased with you, and He's blessed you from the very beginning. Think about this. Adam and Eve, when God created them, what's the very first thing He did? You know what He did? He blessed them. That's where it starts. And if Satan can gaslight you into thinking, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do this, I have to do that, and maybe God will bless me. Maybe he will like me. Maybe he will use me. That's a lie. And Lord, I come right now, and I just speak prophetically, that that lie is broken right now in the name of Jesus Christ. That that lie that I am not good enough is broken. That lie that, uh, uh, that I can't, uh, I'm not worthy and I will never be worthy, that is broken right now in the name of Jesus Christ. That lie that I am a servant of God and I've been serving Him all my life and He ain't gave me nothing. I break that right now. Because that is a lie. Why? Because everything he has is yours. Do not move the ancient boundary that God has established in your life. I speak to the church, too. You know what? There's a boundary that God is establishing for the influence of this church in this community and in this world and as the elders and the leaders get the get find out what that boundary is lynn i just i'm not saying you're doing this lynn i'm just saying i just encourage you don't move the boundary don't move it for any reason don't move the ancient boundaries. I know the Lord has spoken to every single one of us in this room. There's something in our life that we have allowed the enemy to shortchange us on. The lies that we that we have believed and even sometimes it's, it's that lie that says it's never going to change. It's never going to happen. About three weeks ago, I'm just going to share this, and then I'm going to pray for us. We'll be done. About three weeks ago, I listened to a message of a lady about the prodigal. And for years, Debbie and I have prayed for our son, Bailey, and we have, yeah, he's going to come back, but there'd be times the enemy would go, it ain't never going to happen. It ain't ever going to happen. And we were challenged in that word to take and bring that boundary back that the enemy threw his lies and begin to call out his name. Bailey, come home. He lives in Colorado, but the Holy Spirit can cry out to him. Bailey, come home. There's some of you in this room you have prodigals, or there's an area of your life, it's never going to happen. You need to start declaring it and speaking it out. God, bring it back. 
Bring it back to me. I want the joy of my salvation. I want the joy that only comes from you, not the happiness of the world. It flees. Your joy sustains, and it's everlasting to everlasting. And so, God, I just pray for us right now. Let us cry out, and let us not be afraid. Well, what will people think? Or what is this? What is that? That's the lie of the enemy. He tries to convince us. Oh, they're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think you, you don't understand anything. No, God, what we do understand is that you are a good God, and you have the best in store for your sons and daughters, and we're going to stand on the promise of your word. That is this word of God that was spoken over us this morning has been sent forth. It will not return without accomplishing what you so desired. And I pray that over every single one of us right now. And so, God, I, I, I pray that as we go forth, that we really begin to do some deep, deep soul searching. Because some of us have allowed the enemy to almost box us in and say, this is the meager existence you're going to have. And God is saying, bust out of that and put them back where it was and live the life that I've called you to live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey. I'm telling you, the Word of God has been spoken today. We have heard the Word of God. Now it's up to us to begin to live it out. And if you heard it, there's no excuse to not live it out. I'm sorry. God didn't go, well, you know, I'll, I'll give you a pass. No, we've got to take and go forth. Well, let's put some of our action, our, our lives into action in ministry. On your way out, see Miss Sarah. By the spirit of Christmas tree, get a name. And not only just get that name and go, we're going to buy again. You begin to pray for that individual, that little boy, that little girl, that teenager, that family that God will use what you give to make a spiritual impact on their lives. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Have a great Thanksgiving. And we'll see you next Sunday if the Lord doesn't come back before then. God bless you.